All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Okay. Good afternoon, sir. Yes, sir. We are all fine. All right. Um, we are fine. Thank you. You're always welcome. All right. So let's quickly go through what we started with last week. Um, you can kindly share your class page or if you have contacts of your friends, let them know that lecture is in session. So they should hurry and join. All right. While we wait so for is your... the network or... uh, No problem. Mm -hmm. While we wait for your colleagues to join. Most of us can join. Okay. Um, is it better? <clears throat> While we're waiting for your friends to come aboard, let me say that I'm quite impressed with the way the agency with which some of you are working to present your, uh, I would say, semester essay. I've, I've received a couple of them. I haven't been able to read all of them, but I think some of them are very exciting uh, to enjoy. So for those of you who are doing very good work, I encourage you to go ahead. Um, I pray that nobody would, would uh, plagiarize the colleagues' work, but do a very genuine and uh, personal work. It has a lot of uh, uh, soft skill to add on to you if you endear yourself to it. Are you okay there? The, art of reading content and distilling uh, the wheat from the chaff is not something we can teach you in class. But as you see yourself to go through uh, the, the demand of the essay in your attempt to excel and present a very good work, you realize that you end up also cultivating this skill. So, um, let me encourage you to do that. All right. Uh, if you haven't submitted your work, the deadline is not up yet, so you still have some time, but I will encourage you to give attention to it and uh, work at it to complete it and submit it in time. All right, I remember last week um, we were looking at what? ISO enzymes. I think essentially that's what we did throughout the session. So look at the ISO enzymes and its implication on health of an individual. Today, uh, I look forward to finishing with enzymes. So we're gonna look at factors that affect the activity of enzyme, and then we will close with enzymes in clinical diagnosis or medical application of enzymes. Please, are you with me? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So, yes. all right. So, will somebody courageously share with us what you picked up from our discussion on ISO enzymes? Yes. Anybody? Hello. So a class of over 300 people, are you telling me nobody's ready? 
or I should be calling names. Say the question again. The question is, just tell us what you picked up from last week's discussion. Uh-huh, okay. Last week. Yes, please. Okay. Yeah, Esther. Last week. Uh, okay. The last week, we spoke about the types of uh, the different types of uh, allo enzyme, uh, iso enzymes, and we uh -huh. have the true enzyme, which we said are products of the same. And then we have the allo enzymes, products of different iso enzymes. Then no, we talked about the alleles, not different iso enzymes. Uh, alleles. Different alleles. Allelic recombination. Yes, sir. All right. And then we spoke about two types of uh, isoenzymes. Uh -huh. That's the lact uh, lactate. Lactate, and then we have the creatinine. creatinine. The, the, the lactate is not an isoenzyme. Lactate is just a bio, a bio compound, a biological molecule. Okay, sir. So I'm sure you won't see something, but you didn't write it well. Yes, and then so we check. talk about the ethics, the characteristics of isoenzymes. Okay. Of which we spoke about their electrophoretic mobility. Hey, Uzi, instead <laughs> of you to talk about what you can explain, look at what you are saying. <laughs> okay, so let's hear you. What is it about? I said that one, you said they can move at different speed on an electric field. Excellent. And the reason was what? Pa, 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 pa. Then, what was the reason? Hey. Somebody will help. Somebody will help. Can you call that somebody? <laughs> okay, thank you. Yes, let me take Madam Patience. Madam Patience, your hand is up. Okay. I also learned that I can Hello. Hi. Okay. Uh, I also learned that. Hey, please kindly mute your mics. I don't have the sentence doesn't permit me to mute you from here. Paulina. Hello, Madam okay, Paulina, please. Yes. Uh, I learned that isoenzymes are also referred to as isozymes. Mm -hmm. And they are enzymes that catalyze the same reaction. And with the characteristics, they are inhibitors. They are also tissue localization. Please, they are and not, so uh, please calm down. They are not inhibitors. They can be okay. inhibited by a common inhibitor. Okay, okay. But Thank to you. different extent. Okay. Please, are you with me? Okay. Yes, sir. As enzymes, they are just like you and your twin sister. Um, I'm sure you are. When we talk about iso enzymes, it's not anything to. It's just you and your twin sister. No matter how identical you are, you still have your uniqueness. Okay. You may have different preference for what. For rice. Yes. So yes, you may all like rice, but maybe you may either like it so much than hair or so less than hair. Paulina, Paulina. Madam, Madam Candy, please don't shout at your friends, please. Just courteously let them know. 
that their mic is on. And so there's a lot of noise from their background. I beg you, please, don't raise your voice at anybody. Okay, you don't know where they are joining us from. I don't know their situation. So be careful, please. Thank you. Madam Pat, are you fine? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, and one another characteristic to is that you said their heat stability. Uh -huh. What did I say about their heat stability? That one, I need a bailout. Okay. So who's going to bail you out? Madam Paulina. <laughs> hey! You want to bring the issues here? Well, no problem. <laughs> Madam Paulina, if you heard your name, make yourself available to answer this question. All right. Well, Madam now. Joyce, your hand is up. Yes, sir. Good Hello, afternoon. Sir. Good afternoon, sir. I hope you are very well. Yes, I, yes, I'm fine. I okay, have, what yeah. about you? Well, by the grace of the Lord, we are also kicking and doing very well. We thank God. Amen. Amen. Let's hear you. So I also learned that in lactate dehydrinate, we said in migration, in terms of uh, in electrophoresis, migration of dehydration is always faster than that of LDH5 is always slow. That's Please calm down. Uh, hello, Madam Joyce. Can you say that again? I didn't hear you. All. I said what I heard last was about the LD1 and LD5. Please, that's not the what? like LD, LD1. LDH. Uh -huh. LDH1. That's like take the hydrogenase mm -hmm. and the uh -huh. That's what I'm saying. I learned you said what I, I can remember was you said that one in electrophoresis migration of uh, LDH1 is always faster and then LDH5 is always slower. That is what I can also recollect and I said let me share. Okay. All right. Um, forgive me. I, I, I think my network got bad. All right, so let's let's go. I guess we spent enough time on the recap, and we have quite a number of you uh, present in class, so we can move on. All right, so just to wrap up what our colleagues were all sharing last week, we looked at ISO enzymes. We said that essentially they are enzymes which catalyze the same biochemical reaction, but they differ in their structure. Are you okay? They differ in what? Their physical form or their structure. And uh, it's more or less like, as I said earlier to one of you, it's just like identical twins. They can even be identical triplets. As identical as they are, uh, there will still be uniqueness among them. Sometimes the uniqueness can be gender. So they can be identical, but there will be male and female. They can be identical, but you would realize that maybe one is taller than the other. One is more heavy than the other, in one way or the other. So physically, in terms of the form of the structure or in terms of the structure of the enzyme, there is some level of variability, even though they do the same thing. Are you okay? Even though physiologically they will do the same thing. And we're looking at what brings about these things. The first thing is that sometimes the differences arise as a result of what? Different tissues from where they originate. So when they occur in different tissues, then of course their form will change. It's just like you and your sister. If you are born in Ghana, you grew up in Ghana, and then your sister, your own blood sister or brother, happens to be born somewhere in the US and grew up in the US. Are you okay? As per your age, if you meet, or if for nothing at all, at least your accent, will be different. 
your complexion may be a bit different because you live in the tropics. They live in the west. Are you okay? So there would be some level of variability, even though a DNA test will show that you are actually siblings. But then you will all pass your DNA test from your parents. Are you okay? But because of your geographical origin, are you okay? There would be variation. So tissue localization can bring about what? Differences in isoenzyme. Then again, we also saw that um, allelic arrangement, that is the genes that recombine to produce a particular protein that's required for folding into that enzyme can also result in what changes are you okay in the structure of the enzyme then species variation are you okay species variation so a bacteria can produce a particular enzyme maybe you can have plant producing amylase then humans also producing amylase and bacteria also producing amylase and maybe a fungus also producing amylase. Now you realize that when you check the structure of these amylases, they may be doing the same thing functionally, but because of the species differences in, in terms of where they are originating, that can also cause what we call variability in terms of their physical structure. Are you okay? So generally, these are some of the things that account for the uh, workings or how isoenzymes are come about within our physiological setting. Um, we saw that isoenzymes, because of their tissue, uh, variation in tissue co-localization, this can be exploited in disease world diagnosis. So we look at the example of what? Creatine kinase, which has three isoenzymes. Are you okay? We have uh, CKBB, CKMM, and CKMB. We saw that creatine kinase BB, the BB isoform originates more in the brain. Then the CKMM, that's creatine kinase MM, rather originates from where? From the muscle. Are you okay? And then CKMB rather originate from what? The heart. And so I told you that for patients who are known hypertensives, a lot of the time, one of the regular checkups that they have to do is to check for what? The CKMB levels. Because it gives a, a, an indication of the possibility of <laughs> cardiac arrest. Are you okay? So constantly, clinicians will recommend that patients uh, check up for their CKMB levels uh, and so on. Then we looked at the example of what? Um, lactate dehydrogenase, LDH. And we said that there are five isoenzymes of lactate dehydrogenase, which are often denoted as what? LDH1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And we said that even though these are all isoenzymes and catalyze the same biochemical Now watch this. Once they catalyze the same biochemical reaction, it means that they are specific for the same substrate and they produce the same product. Are you okay? So these are five different enzymes. We show specificity for a common substrate and then producing what? A common product. Are you okay? Now, we also saw that um, these isoenzymes can differ because of their variation in their physical form. That can affect their heat stability. It can also affect their general molecular weight. And so it can significantly or directly affect what they are electrophoretic what mobility. Again, it affects the way they interact with um, um, inhibitors. 
Madam Brago, I will attend to you. Okay, give me time. Let me finish with my statement. So isoenzymes differ in terms of their heat stability, their electrophoretic mobility, their re interaction with what? With inhibitors and etc. cetera. Are you okay? Um, so let me pause here. Madam Bravo, I saw your hand. Do you have any question? Sir, please, it's not a question. Uh, if you're sharing something on your screen, I'm not, I'm not sharing. It. I'm not sharing anything. Mrs. Ofori, are you okay? Yes, please. Thank you. You're welcome. Then, sir, share something. <laughs> oh, what should I share? Share your screen. <laughs> no, I'm recapping what we did last week. Are you okay? Okay, sir. Were you in class last week? Yes, please. Okay, then I'm sure this is not new to you. Madam Rebecca, please turn off your camera. I beg you, you and your little boy, please turn off your camera. Thank you. Wait. Madam Rebecca, please turn yeah, off. Allow your them, allow them. No, it's not necessary. I don't even know where I am. Bro. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's let's go on. Um, all right. So let me share what we are going to do today. I said that we are going to look at factors that affect what the activity of enzymes. I'm sure you remember. Yes, yes sir. Okay, so can we discuss it shortly? What are the factors that affect the activity of enzymes? How can enzymes be controlled physically? What are the physical factors that can be used to control the activity of enzyme? Yes. Anybody? Hello, class. I'm 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 waiting for your feedback. Higher temperatures. Higher temperatures, okay. Enzyme concentration. Enzyme concentration. pH. pH. It looks like some of you you have you have you, you <laughs> is this Baba or something? <laughs> I, I can imagine some of you are reading from a source. Handouts. Jesus Christ. No, sir, you are not reading. The last time I went to the server. Johnny, you don't like people, poor Johnny. Oh, that's Jesus so, Christ. <laughs> so you already have, you already have a poor end. Eh? Yeah. So yeah. they are first students. I'm a boy. They are first the students. They are reading. Please, can you all see my screen here? No, sir. Not no, sir. It's not sharing. No, sir. It has come, sir. All right. Yes, yeah. yeah. sir. Yes. Oh, okay. So I want us to watch this shortly and then we'll talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, permit me to share this again uh, so you can hear the sound well. That's open. I know it's coming. Has it come now? Oh, it went again. Yes, yes. Let's play with the Nessie. And how they work. In this video, though, we'll consider how temperature and pH affect the food. Yes. Yes, yes. yes sir. Hey. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> and in order to measure this, we need to know how to calculate the rate of a chemical reaction. Let's start with temperature. 
This here is a graph that shows how the rate of an enzyme controlled reaction changes with temperature. We can see that as temperature increases, so does the rate. But after about 37 degrees, the rate starts to drop rapidly. This is because the high temperatures start to break some of the bonds, holding the enzymes together. And so the active site starts to change shape. If it changes shape too much, then the enzyme won't be able to bind the substrate and catalyze the reactions anymore. And at this point, we'd say that the enzyme has been denatured. The temperature at which an enzyme functions best is known as its optimum temperature. So the optimum temperature of this enzyme would be 37 degrees, because that's the temperature at which the rate peaks. As the human body is generally capped around 37 degrees, this is a pretty common optimum temperature for human enzymes. But different enzymes can have different optimum temperatures. Now, if you remember from chemistry, pH is a measure of acidity. And we can see by looking at this graph that if the pH is too high or too low, it can lower the rate of the reaction. Just like with high temperatures, this happens because the enzyme's bonds start to break, which causes the active site to change shape. At first, there may just be a small change in shape, so the substrate can still fit, just not quite as well. This slows down the rate of reaction, but doesn't quite stop it. Soon though, the active site changes shape so much that the substrate can't fit at all. And at this point, the enzyme is said to be denatured. The optimal pH will depend on where the enzyme normally works. For example, most enzymes in our body work best at neutral pHs of around seven. Whereas the enzymes that work in the stomach, for example, have an optimal pH of around two because that's the rough pH of the stomach. In order to create a graph like the ones we've just seen, we need to be able to calculate the rate for the chemical reactions ourselves. Now, what exactly we do is gonna depend on the particular question, but generally, we would be told how much a certain reactant or product changes by, and the time that it took to change. And then all we do is divide the change in reactant or product by the time it took. For example, a question could sound something like this. An enzyme controlled reaction produces 30 centimeters cubed of hydrogen gas in two minutes. What was the rate of reaction in centimeters cubed per second? So for this question, we would divide our 30 centimeters cubed of hydrogen gas, which was produced as a product by the time of two minutes. But because we need our answer to be per second, not per minute, we have to multiply our minutes by 60 to get 120 seconds. And so our answer would be 30 over 120, which is 0 0.25 centimeters cubed per second. That's it for now. If you enjoyed it, do give us a like and subscribe. Or if you have any thoughts about anything we could do differently, then just let us know down in the comments below. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Right, um, so welcome back. It was very short, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Engine Alchemist and is an AI-powered sure map-making application that allows you to make a... Time. Isn't it? Yes, sir. So can you tell me what you picked up? Victoria. Yes, sir. Yeah, let's hear you. Sir, please. I, I had wanted to ask a question. My network was somewhere. The, oh. With the last part, you know, he, uh, the, 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 is it the, the, with the mathematics, the person, yeah. the computer, the video divided the reaction what? by the time. The time was supposed to be in second. Please, he multiplied the two by what? 60 or. No, 60. It's like 60 seconds make one minute. So two minutes will be oh, two okay. times 60. Two times 60. the 60. Oh, yes. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you very You're much. Welcome. Yes, Nina. Hi. What I heard was that that affects the work of the enzyme. 
Okay. One is temperature. I know the temperature, it says that uh, most enzymes, they have their normal temperature that they function. And if that uh, temperature is uh, altered, it affects the enzyme. It, it, it denatures the enzyme. They are, it decreases in their activity. And also with the pH level, right. that when the pH level of the enzymes are altered, it slows down the action of the enzyme. Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. I think I saw. Yes, Mrs. Okai, I saw your hand up. Please forgive me. Um, may I hear you? All right. Mrs. Okai, okay. can you hear me? Okay, so yes. Okay, and and name rejoice. Mrs. Rejoice, can we hear you? So what did you pick up from the video? Just something small. Yes. Okay. Yes, Raphael too. Sir, from the video, I learned that most enzymes or enzymes have their optimal temperature. Okay. And when they go beyond the optimal temperature, the uh, active site begins to change in shape and the substrate, substrate can't fit. And hence, the action of the enzyme would be interrupted. Oh, that is wonderful. I, I, I just love how you ended it. Well done. Uh, clap, clap for the girl. So today, I'm not sharing things. Am I not sharing what? <laughs> but what's up, yeah. Please. Oh, okay, okay. No, those were for last week. Okay. Today, I forgot to the jollof. Today uh, is it? Uh, you want your love, eh? I'm sure you don't mind your love. Madam Joyce, uh, rejoice. I'm sure you are there. Do you care for some a plate of your love? We want the twins. You want what? <laughs> twins. You want twins. Age. Interesting. May God give you twins. Eh? Amen. 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 <laughs> All right. So, essentially, if you watch the video carefully, you would realize that for every enzyme, there is a particular set of conditions in which it is able to work effectively. Be it temperature, be it pH, be it enzyme concentration, and so on and so forth. The temperature at which an enzyme works so well or better is termed as what? Well, the optimal, optimal temperature. temperature. Yes. Are you okay? And the pH at which an enzyme works better is called what? Well, the optimal pH. And different enzymes tend to have different what? Optimal temperature and optimal what? pH. I just want to show you a short graph. Yeah. I think those of you who have copies of the book, you would know you would have them. But let me just show you. And then we take off from there. So if you look at this graph, which is a comparison of different enzymes and the different what? PHEs. Please, I hope you can all see this graph. Yes, sir. Can somebody courageously explain what this graph is communicating to you? We can see, but it's not clear. Oh, really? Refresh your page, madam. I'm sure you should get it. Uh, 
Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, Hello. sir. All right. So. Hello. Yeah. I so what message is this graph communicating to you? Can somebody share it with me? Yeah, Madam Janet. So it's communicate um the optimum pH of um the enzymes. You can see that um salivary amylase have an optimum pH of um two, and that sure? of the yes, please. That's pepsin. That's pepsin. Okay, yes, please. That's pepsin. Sorry, and then the salivary amylase pH of um seven. So that's what I can see. Okay. Yes, any other view? Yes, any other view? Rafi, how to? Yeah. What I say is that person as um acidity or uh, acidity of two is is uh, listen optimal pH. Then when it goes beyond two, the graph starts to slope steeply. So the chemical reaction will start um reducing. It's getting interrupted when the uh, pH goes beyond two. Mm. Okay, thank you, Rafia. To yes, any other person? An enzyme is a protein with a three-dimensional structure which acts as a catalyst in chemical reactions. A substrate, on the other hand, is a substance upon which an enzyme acts in that chemical reaction. The enzyme has a specific area known as an active site which fits yes. specifically with the substrate. Enzyme substrate specificity can be explained using the lock and key model. In this model, the enzyme represented in blue acts like a lock while the substrate, that in orange, act like a key. Notice how yeah, Mr. the David, substrate Mr. fits specifically into the enzyme's active site. Hello. It is important to note that although it is two-dimensional, the yeah. enzyme's active site is three-dimensional. It's only the substrate which is going to by the reaction. So if the substrate and the lower, the lower match the ability of an enzyme well, sir, to between the two competing you know, substrates is called as the and then the uh, highly specific the, the reaction they can ah, okay sorry yes mr yanki yes sir the enzyme a pepsin is in an acidic state uh, which is two which is uh, it, it, that's the uh, that's the optimal state of a uh, pepsin, which is acidic. Okay. Now, salivary amylase is in the neutralization state of a uh, of a substance. Hello, everyone. This video is about and enzyme uh, I can... I, and I can see enzyme agonist uh, being a basic enzyme, mm -hmm. a basic enzyme of um of um an uh, an optimum of ten. Okay, 
not exactly 10, but close to 10, maybe 9.6, 9.7. Yes. So it is Are showing you... the various states of the enzymes. Some, that's a, a, an acidic enzyme, a, a, a neutralized state, and a basic state. Okay. Not necessarily neutralizing, please. It is just showing us different enzymes and their optimal pHs where they work. Please, are you with me? Please, yes. So different enzymes and then different optimal pHs. And these are physiological enzymes. Pepsin or care or work in the stomach. It is responsible for protein digestion. Salivary amylase or care where in the saliva where the pH is near neutral. Arginase work in the small intestine where bile acid, I, sorry, bile salt is often released to neutralize what? The gastric acid to create some kind of an alkaline environment. And so you would realize that arginase will work effectively in a small intestine, while salivary amylase will work better within the mouth. Are you okay? Yes. Now, let me ask you this follow-up graph. What do you think happens to salivary amylase when it is swallowed down with food into the stomach? Well, what does, what does it do? Nature. And that's what. It's denatured. It's denatured. Very good. So it becomes denatured and it can continue with the carbohydrate breakdown. That is one of the reasons why we say that carbohydrate digestion does not occur where in the stomach because the enzyme responsible for carbohydrate digestion, be it the salivary amylase, become denatured in the acid environment of what? The stomach. Are you okay? Yes, yes, sir. Please, any question? So just a quick wrap up. I said that among the factors that affect the activity of enzyme include what? Temperature, pH, enzyme concentration. That means the amount of enzyme you are actually pouring upon the substrate can tell whether the substrate can be converted to product quickly or it may take a while. Are you okay? Then the amount of substrate that's also available for the enzyme to work on it. I'm sure you understand that if you take just a handful of corn dough and give it to salivary amylase to break it down, are you okay? It can do so in a shorter time as comparing it to a, a whole bucket of corn dough. Are, are you okay? So the amount of substrate available can affect the rate of the reaction. Then the concentration of the enzyme, the presence or absence of what inhibitors can also affect the enzyme. And then the presence or absence of what we call what activators. Sometimes some of these activators include what the the um, um, the uh, what we discussed about the uh, multivitamins, are you okay? Which often would act as what prosthetic group or coenzymes, are you okay? So the presence or absence of some of these factors, be it metal ion, be it coenzyme, be it activators, are you okay? Are very very important to 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 uh, to influence the relative activity of the enzyme at a time. Please, are you with me? Yes, sir. Yes, yeah. All right. So let's, there was something I jumped 
and I want to quickly do it. Forgive me, it looks like I'm sharing a lot of video with you. The reason is very simple. Uh, number one, your class size is too large. Number two, many of you are doing this course for the very first time. And so I have had to adapt various ways of bringing everybody on board and to make the class as visualizable as possible. And that's why for most of the phenomenon I've been talking about, I try to use animations so that you would really be able to visualize the phenomenon I am trying to share. I hope you are not bothered or you are not really, uh, 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 yeah, I hope you are not bothered about the many videos I'm showing. Not at all. No, not at all. like it. You like it. Like the videos, crap. All right. So, so let's look at enzyme specificity. Um, who is this person? Pukia Anichild. Am I right? Yes, sir. Please, I want to ask, can water affect the activity of enzyme? Please say that again. Water. Mm -hmm. Can it affect the activity of enzyme? Okay. The answer is yes and no. Let me start with the no. Water in itself is not an inhibitor. So water does not affect the activity of the enzyme, of an enzyme. Are you okay? However, I said yes because sometimes the water may dilute the substrate. Are you okay? So when it dilutes the substrate, it decreases the substrate concentration. And once you decrease substrate concentration, what happens? You lower the activity of what? The enzyme. Thank you, sir. Okay, I'm sure you understood me. Yes, please. Hello. Hello. Thank please. you, sir. Okay, I'm sure you got the message, right? Yes, please. Okay. So I want us to watch another. Hello, everyone. On Welcome what to the I call enzyme specificity. Let's say it together. Enzyme specificity. Okay. <laughs> Are you there? Yes. Okay. Please. Has my screen loaded? No, no sir. No. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Yes, so let's, sir. Okay, so let's go. So this is just a minute. It's under two minutes. So let's go through it and then... An enzyme is a protein with a three-dimensional structure which acts as a catalyst in chemical reactions. A substrate, on the other hand, is a substance upon which an enzyme acts in a chemical reaction. An enzyme has a specific area known as an active site which fits specifically with the substrate. Enzyme substrate specificity can be explained using the lock and key model. In this model, the enzyme represented in blue acts like a lock while the substrate, that in orange, act like a key. Notice how the substrate fits specifically into the enzyme's active site. It is important to note that although the image is two-dimensional, the enzyme's active site is three-dimensional. It only fits with the substrate for which it's going to catalyze a chemical reaction. So if another substrate comes along here that does not match the enzyme's active site, then no chemical reaction will take place. Therefore, the lock and key model is applicable because with a lock and a key, you have to have the right key to open the lock. So we have to have the right substrate to fit the enzyme's active site to have a chemical reaction take place. All right. Uh, I'm sure you saw the video, right? 
Yes, sir. Okay. So what did you pick up? Yes. Yeah, just then. That the enzyme is three dimensional and that it acts like a lock and the substrate mm -hmm. is the key. Okay. So if another substrate comes along that is not the right fit, it will not be able to cause a reaction. Okay. I, I like your perfect use of the term, right fix. Are you okay? So there are two main ways by which we can explain how enzymes show specificity for a particular substrate. The first, which was the earliest model that was actually conceptualized and theorized and was well accepted in the world of biomedicine was what? The lock and key model. The lock and key model, a similitude of it is what you are seeing here. So what does it mean here? The enzyme becomes what? The active site of the enzyme appear as what? The lock. And then the substrate now function as what? A key. Are you okay? So what happens is that for an enzyme to be able to bind to a substrate and transform it, the substrate must fit perfectly or near perfectly into the active site of what? The enzyme. Are you okay? And once there's that perfect match, then that substrate is transformed to become what? The product. Otherwise, yeah. otherwise, yeah. the enzyme will reject the substrate and will not be able to uh, transform it. So there will not be any effective catalyst. Are you okay? So thank you very much. Yes, any other view? So today I'm going to talk to you about the induced fit model of enzyme catalysis and how... All right. Now, I told you that there are two models that have been proposed to explain what? The specificity of an enzyme. The first one, which is the earliest and the most simplest, is the lock and key. Now, the lock and key assumes that the active site, the shape of the active site of an enzyme is rigid and fixed. Are you okay? It is what? Rigid and what? Fixed. So what it means is that it is already preformed. Are you okay? So the onus rests on the substrate to either fit or is rejected. Are you okay? And by this, okay, the implication is that you can only have one enzyme catalyzing one kind of reaction because different substrates tend to have different shapes. Are you okay? So it's more or less like one enzyme, one reaction, and nothing more and nothing less. And this was, it really enjoyed its time because in a way, when you check the physiological setting, that is exactly what you see. You always have one enzyme catalyzing one kind of biochemical word, reaction. In a case where the reaction may be identical, you are likely to have isoenzymes. But in many cases, as is practicable, you realize that one enzyme catalyzes one biochemical reaction. So you could talk about what 
salivary amylase breaking down what starch and other complex carbohydrates into what maltose, isomaltose, and dextrin and all that. You can talk about um, lactase. I am from one over you. Reduce the lactose. <laughs> So essentially, that is what it meant. But there was also another concern that in certain cases, you are likely to find one enzyme catalyzing different reactions. Are you okay? And we can try one common example here. Let me ask you this. Um, do you all agree that there is protein in egg? Yes, I believe yes. Yes, sir. Is there protein in the fish? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Do, do you agree that there is protein also in beans? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. And do you agree that there is protein in meat? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, do you also agree that there is some protein in milk? Yes. 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 Okay. Now let me find out from you. Are these proteins the same? No. no. Sure? Why? You yes. don't know. The protein in fish, the protein in egg, the protein in beans, are they the same? No. no. Okay. okay. Now, when you take these proteins into your stomach, you realize that. The pepsin, in, uh, which is present in what gastric juice, breaks down or acts on all these proteins. So how can these proteins, which are different, be acted upon by just one enzyme? So what is happening? Is it that it doesn't have an active site? Is it that it is not rigid? What is it? So this phenomenon led to the proposition of another theory, which we call what? Induced faith model. Let's say it together. Induced faith model. Induced faith model. Until now, with Boxon. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Learn A Biology for free with Miss Estrick. So, this video is. Part one of what enzymes, which is enzyme action. Model me. If you are new here, just click subscribe so to make sure you don't miss any of the latest videos. Video. So and the then, first bit of information that you need to know about enzymes. So let's just watch this short video and then we'll come back to the induced fit model. So the first one we watched was about what? Lock and key. Now we're going through the induced fit model. Are you with me? Yes, sir. All right. So let's go. Enzymes is actually quite similar to the level of detail of GPSE. There are some additional features though. So for example, knowing that enzymes are tertiary structure proteins. And if you haven't already learned about the different levels of structure in proteins, then just click here and you can see my video on protein structure. Their function is to catalyze different reactions. So enzymes are relatively large molecules compared to other biological molecules that you learn about. However, it's only a small part of an enzyme which is involved in catalyzing the reaction. And that is the active site, which is a term you would have heard of before at GCSE. So that's what we can see in this diagram. It's only a small section, the active site. And that is where the substrate, which is complementary in shape, will bind and you get enzyme substrate complexes. So the active site is a specific and unique shape, and this is where it links to your A-level knowledge. You need to link it to what you know about protein structure, and in particular, the tertiary structure of a protein. So knowing that the tertiary structure is determined by the sequence of amino acids in the primary structure, that determines where bonds form, how the polypeptide chain folds and therefore the final 3D shape or tertiary structure that you get. And that unique 3D shape is what creates a unique shape active site, which is complementary to one particular substrate. And that is why they're able to bind together to create enzyme substrate complexes. 
And this term here is key. So that term, enzyme substrate complex, will nearly always get a mark in any question, which is to do with the explaining something to do with enzymes. So at A level as well, you need to know there's two models of explaining how enzymes catalyze reactions. Now you probably knew already that they catalyze a reaction by lowering the amount of energy needed for the reaction to occur. And we call that the activation energy. So enzymes lower the activation energy that is required for, an en for the um, reaction. And that's what this graph here is showing you. So we can see here the amount of energy the reactants have. And if you didn't have an enzyme, you would need this level of energy for the reaction to occur. If you add in an enzyme, then it lowers the amount of energy needed for the reaction to occur. Or in other words, it lowers the activation energy. So the two models that we're going to have a look at are the lock and key, which you learned about at GCSE, but also the induced fit model. So the lock and key is the one that you did know from GCSE. And this model is suggesting that the enzyme is like a lock and the substrate is like a key that fits into the lock. And only a key which is exactly complementary in shape to the lock can fit in to turn the lock. And that's what this model is suggesting, that the enzyme's active site is an exact fixed shape, just like a lock would be. And it's due to random collisions between the enzyme and the substrate, they can collide, they then combine because they're complementary in shape, and an enzyme substrate complex forms. Once they are then combined in this enzyme substrate complex, that will cause the substrate to slightly distort in shape, and that distortion can lower the activation energy. The products are then released, the enzyme active site is empty, and it can be reused again. So that's model one, the lock and key model. Model two is induced fit. And this model is more like an analogy of a glove and a hand. So in this model, it suggests that the enzyme is like a glove and the substrate is like your hand. So an empty glove is not exactly complementary to the 3D shape of your hand. However, when you put your hand inside of a glove, the glove molds around your hand to become completely complementary. So what that suggests in terms of enzymes is the enzyme active site is induced, or in other words, it slightly changes shape so that it can completely mold around the substrate that it is almost complementary to. And because the active site does change shape and slightly molds around the substrate when it binds, that puts strain on the bonds and it weakens the bonds. And that is the bonds in the substrate. And because the bonds have been weakened by that strain, that is why less energy is needed for the reaction to occur. Or in other words, the activation energy has been lowered. The product will then again be removed, uh, but the active site will then go back to its original shape. So just to clarify the key differences, in the induced fit model, the active site is almost complementary to the substrate. Oh. However, it will slightly change shape when they collide so that the active site will then mold around the substrate. That will then start to pull and put tension on the bonds in the substrate, making them easier to break and therefore lowering the activation energy. The products can then be removed, they're released, and the active site returns to its original shape, the enzyme can be used again. Now this is the accepted model for how enzymes function. So it is actually that the active site does slightly change shape to mold around the substrate. So this is the accepted model. And that is it for knowing how enzymes work and how they lower the activation energy. Hello.
right. So, uh, will somebody tell us what is the difference between the induced faith and the lock and key? Danny Benjamin McKen. Hello, Madam Esther. Yes, sir. Yes, may we hear you? Sir, the differences are the lock and key model. The active side is uh, unique and specific for a specific sus subscript to fit in, but that of the induced fit model, the active site slightly changes its shape and molds around the subscript, which makes it easy to break. And afterwards, the enzyme can go back to its original shape again. Should I wear the dinosaur? Yeah, that's what I know. <laughs> it's too small. Okay, Madam Esther, thank you. Yes, any other? Mrs. Esla. Is anybody else? Also, oh, is it because today I'm not sharing tilapia in Banku? So, people aren't hungry anymore. <laughs> yeah, Madam Araba. Okay, sir. So, I also heard that for the uh, en uh, enzyme specificity, the substrate is um, the the enzyme has an active site which is specific. It has a specific for a particular substrate. It can only be bound by that substrate, no other form. But for the induced fit. The active site of the enzyme is almost complementary to the substrate. It's not exactly the same, but almost. So when the substrate binds to the active site, the enzyme changes form a little so that it can be bound completely to it. But because it changes its form, the bond is not so strong. So it makes the bond a little weak and hence it requires low activation energy. That's what I heard. That's what you learned. Okay, that's yes. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, anybody else? Okay, Anita. Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I also told her that with the reduced space, the active size changes in shape to slightly mold around the substrate so that it can fit. And as it does that, the, there is loss of bond or something. That's what I, I, I mean. Okay, Mrs. Asante, thank you. Yeah, Nina. Welcome back. 
Hello, Nina. Yeah. yeah. Sir, please, can you hear me? Sure, I can. So, please, what I heard with the induced state, you know, I heard that the enzymes, you know, they mostly, they change when they bind to a substrate. So when the substrate, when it enters into the active site, the enzyme slightly change so that it will accommodate the substrate better. That's wonderful. Very wonderful. Thank you. When I'm in sure why. Amen. For five months. <laughs> what did I hear? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like I heard something. Oh, I didn't hear. Hey, Max. Mm. So ten marks and God bless you, which is which is most profitable. So I want both. Madam Nina, you are yeah. too. All right. Yeah, Michelle. Okay. Yes. So essentially, if you compare the induced fit to the lock and key, the lock and key appears to be all. Uh, the lock and key proposed that the active site of the enzyme is very rigid. So there should definitely be what? A perfect match. Are you okay? So there's uncompromisingly a perfect match required for catalysis to be effected. But in a case of the induced fit, some level of flexibility is allowed. So you would realize that the enzyme binds to the substrate, which may not be a perfect fix, but the enzyme is able to uh, adjust its active site to uh, accommodate the substrate. Are you okay? In position. So this is what I would say briefly. If there's any question, All right, now what is the implication here? The implication is that for enzymes that operate by lock and key, they tend to have what we call rigid specificity. Shall we all say it together? Rigid, rigid specificity. Okay, so, hey. yes, so they, they, more or less, they more or less have, more or less like, a perfect kind of fix. Are you okay? So rigid specificity. Then those so let us say it again. Oh, rigid. I'm sure you heard it, Madam Messi. <laughs> okay. So then we have what you call the general specificity, which is accustomed to enzymes that function by what we call what induced fit model or type of specificity. So enzymes that employ induced fit model of selecting the associate, they are more flexible and more general. And you could realize that pepsin may be operating by that. That's how come it can accommodate and catalyze the transformation of different substrates. Are you okay? So that is that. Please, are you fine? Yes, sir. All right. Any, any question? If there's no question, then let's look at enzymes in clinical diagnosis and then we'll close for the day. So how are enzymes employed in the diagnosis of what disease. Now, before we do that, I want us to touch on
Certain chemicals interfere with enzymes and make them not work as well. Hello, class. Please. Yes, sir. Oh, you are my yes. screen. Yes, yes sir. sir. Okay, so let's yes, look at, okay, so let's look at enzyme inhibition. When we say inhibition, what are we trying to talk about here? It's just an English word, meaning what? To interfere, to impede, to slow down, or to resist from happening. Are you okay? And many times, there are specific biochemicals. Are you okay? Or biocompounds. Some of them are organic in nature. Some are inorganic. But what they do is that they block enzymes from acting or from catalyzing by chemical reaction. And because of what they do, we call them what? Inhibitors. Are you okay? Now, there are three types of inhibition. And I want us to just watch this short video as an introduction, and then we'll look at the various forms. So let's go. This is called enzyme inhibition, and the chemicals that cause it are called inhibitors. To understand how enzyme inhibitors work, you must know a bit about how enzymes normally function. Usually, substrates fit into the active site of an enzyme where the reaction is helped along. One way that an inhibitor can function is by blocking the active site. This is called competitive inhibition because the competitive inhibitor competes with the substrate for the active site. If the inhibitor beats the substrate to the active site, the substrate can't get in and the reaction can't happen. Another type of inhibition is non-competitive inhibition, also known as allosteric inhibition. A non-competitive inhibitor does not compete for the active site. Instead, it attaches to a different place on the enzyme known as an allosteric site. This changes the shape of the enzyme so that it can no longer bind to the substrate. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe, and check out the other free games. Hello. 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 So what did, what did you see? Oh, class. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Just tell me, what did you see from the video I showed? Sir, they said there are three types. Competitive inhibitors, non-competitive or allosteric. And the competitive, they always bind to the site, preventing the original substrate. I'm listening. And with the non-competitive inhibitors, they bind to the enzyme at a site known as the allosteric site. And when it does that, it changes the shape of the active site, active sites, and the substrates are not fitting, thereby rendering it functional. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm dear. Thank you very much. Today welcome, I talk, yeah. I have some jollof and some chicken here. I guess you don't mind for them. Oh yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, so get your share and get your share. All right. So very interesting. So at least we are seeing two different kinds of what enzyme inhibition here. And practically this occurs within physiological systems. Is it sweet? Okay. This occurs within our physiological systems. And there are ways by which our body is able to uh, 
regulate enzyme activity so that the activity of enzymes is not left to continue unabated. That would be very suicidal. Are you okay for all of us? Okay, now there are three different types of what? Enzyme inhibition. The first is called what? Competitive inhibition. Shall we all say it together? Competitive, competitive inhibition. inhibition. Okay. Now, in competitive inhibition, what it means is that the inhibitor is competing with the substrate. So the inhibitor is somewhat shaped like the substrate so that it will compete with the substrate for the active site of the enzyme. Are you okay? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. Then the, there is also what you call non competitive inhibition. In non competitive inhibition, as you saw in the earlier video, the substrate. Are you okay? must not be identical to what the inhibitor. Actually, the inhibitor doesn't bind to the active site of the enzyme. So the substrate can have the active site of the enzyme all for itself. But what happens is that the inhibitor will bind to any part of the enzyme and by so doing, change the shape of the active site of the enzyme so that the enzyme will no longer be able to transform the substrate into the desired product. And if that cannot happen, then it means that the enzyme activity has been impeded or inhibited. Then there is also what we call non-uncompetitive inhibition. Now, in the case of uncompetitive inhibition, what happens is that the inhibitor will not bind to the free enzyme it will not also bind to the active site of the enzyme. But what do they do? The uncompetitive inhibitor will wait until the enzyme has bound to a substrate and form enzyme substrate complex. After the enzyme has achieved that, then the inhibitor will bind to the enzyme. And once it does that, the enzyme active site will lose shape. And so the enzyme will not be able to transform the substrate into required work product. Okay. Uh, please, can you take that one again? I'm saying that in uncompetitive inhibition, the enzyme, are you okay? The inhibitor will not bind to the enzyme. I'm oh, sorry, it will not bind to the free enzyme. So it won't bind to the active site of the enzyme or bind to the enzyme when it is not even bound to the substrate. But what the, the inhibitor does is that you wait until the enzyme is bound to a particular substrate to form what you call enzyme substrate complex. Now, as soon as the enzyme does that, then the inhibitor will come and bind to the enzyme substrate complex and will hold the enzyme there. It will transform the active site so the enzyme will not be able to work, transform the substrate. 
Are you okay? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. So these are the three forms of what? Enzyme inhibition. Now, in what way is enzyme inhibition important? So I'm going to show you how a particular enzyme inhibitor is used in treating a particular disease. Are you okay? So it's just to let you appreciate All right, so like I said, enzyme inhibitors are very, very important in biomedicine. They are used for treating various diseases, right from normal inflammation to serious conditions like hypertension and all that. So I'm going to show you a short video on what you call AC inhibitors. AC is what? Can somebody tell me? What does the acronym ACE mean? Yes, madam, can we hear you? Angiotensin converting enzymes. Oh, perfect, perfect, perfect. So we're going to look at how angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. So these are inhibitors which will inhibit what? Angiotensin converting enzymes. So when they inhibit the enzyme, what is achieved? Are you okay? Therapeutically. So that is what we are going to look at now. Are you already? Has the page loaded? Yes, sir. All right. So let's go. If your doctor has prescribed you ACE inhibitors such as Ramipril and Enalapril, it may be because you have high blood pressure or heart failure or have had a heart attack. ACE inhibitors work by inhibiting the mechanism that the body normally uses to maintain blood pressure. Angiotensin 1 is an enzyme in your bloodstream. Angiotensin converting enzyme, ACE, converts angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 is an enzyme that narrows your blood vessels and releases hormones that can raise your blood pressure. ACE inhibitors stop ACE from doing this conversion, reducing the levels of angiotensin 2 in your body. Lowering your levels of angiotensin 2 relaxes your blood vessels and reduces your blood pressure to a normal level. Lowering your levels of angiotensin 2 also means more salt passes through your kidneys and takes water with it into your urine. Reducing the amount of fluid in your body means there is a smaller volume of blood for the heart to pump. By relaxing your blood vessels and reducing the amount of fluid in your blood vessels, ACE inhibitors help to control your blood pressure. This reduces the strain on your heart and arteries. If you have heart failure or have had a heart attack, ACE inhibitors may also be used to help improve your heart's muscle pumping action. So, you may be prescribed ACE inhibitors even if your blood pressure is at a normal level. Before you stop or change any medication, even if you're worried about side effects, talk to your GP first, as changing ACE inhibitors help to control your blood pressure. This reduces the strain on your heart and arteries. If you have heart failure or have had a heart attack, ACE inhibitors may also be used to help improve your heart's muscle pumping action. So, you may be prescribed ACE inhibitors even if your blood pressure is at a normal level. All right. Please, does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. So we are not just studying this for studying sake. Understanding enzymes, understanding inhibitors, understanding these conditions or factors that influence enzyme activity are very, very important because we can harness them in various fields for studying enzyme activity. Or it can be harnessed as you saw in this short video. Are you okay into 
therapeutic treatment or possibly management of what hypertension. Are you okay? An improvement of what of general health. So this has a lot. I mean, if you have time, you can read on the application of uh, enzyme inhibition in pharmacology or in treatment of various diseases or in medication, you would realize that even normal painkillers like para, aspirin, and all that all work as well. Enzyme inhibitors. Are you okay? So make time to read about them. I'm not going to touch them next week. I'd wanted to finish with enzymes in clinical diagnosis, but it looks like time is already up. So I will reserve that for next week so that we can wrap up with this. But please do read it on enzyme inhibition in clinical pharmacology. Please, are you with me? And look at various <laughs> drugs, various drugs that act as what well, inhibitors and are used <laughs> in various what or therapy. Please, does anybody have a question? <laughs> question. <laughs> yes. Any question for me? Before I share my jollof rice. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, please, sir. Uh, it's about uh, our uh, house. If it's ready, you let us get it. No, no, no. Um, please kindly talk to your rep. Okay, we don't bring those issues here. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Fusina, I think you first raise your hand. Yeah, I'll come to you, okay? Hello, sir. Hi. Sir, please, I want to find out the inhibitors, the competitive and the non-competitive. Are they the same as the reversible and irreversible inhibitors? No, reversible means that reversible and irreversible has to do with the ability, it, it depends on the extent to which the um, inhibitor bind. Some inhibitors will bind so weakly. Are you okay? They don't bind too strongly. They bind weakly to the enzyme. So when it happens like that, the enzyme can detach itself. So that, that inhibition becomes what? Reversible. But there are instances where an inhibitor will bind sort of permanently with an inhibit, uh, an enzyme. So in that case, the, the enzyme cannot detach itself from what? The inhibitor. Are you okay? Yes, sir. All right. Yes. Um, yeah, let me take your question and then I'll close the class. Please, no, 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 more, no more questions. Are you okay? Time's already fast spent. Yes, yeah. I wanted to know how do we get to know if we completed our work? Mrs. Bano, please speak louder for us to hear. I want to know when we send the assignment, what signal do I get? Hello, Yabua. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, please I, go ahead. I'm listening. Yes, I think the assignment is submitted through the mail. Uh -huh. What signal do I get to be assured? Yes, there's an automatic feedback that I have set for all mails received. So you're going to get that feedback, feedback if okay. your message land in my mail. If it is sent truly into my inbox, you get a feedback um, um, reply. Okay, because I've not received that. And I, I sent another one to be sure if you actually received it. All right, maybe I'll check. I okay, but I've actually said that since I asked, because I knew people would be sending that. And it's quite a load, are you yes, okay? So yes. I wouldn't be able to sit down and be replying everybody. So I set an automatic response for whosoever sent the message okay. I mean, to my mail. So I'll check it. Uh, okay. 
if you've drawn my attention to it. Thank you. Okay. All right. So thanks to everyone for coming. At least just to sum up what we've done today, we looked at what factors that affect enzyme activity. And we said that enzymes can be influenced by what? Extremes of temperature. So too cold, too warm, or too hot temperatures can denature enzyme and make them ineffective. Then extremes of pH. Are you okay? Too acidic, too alkaline. Are you okay? Can also affect enzyme activity and make them ineffective. Then we also saw that concentration of enzyme, concentration of substrate, all can affect what? And then the presence or absence of what? Inhibitors, all can affect the activities of enzyme. We've seen that in the latter part, there are three ways by which inhibitors can influence the activity of enzyme. They can, one, compete with the substrate for the active site, are you okay? in which case we call it competitive inhibition, or they can bind to any alternative part of the enzyme outside of the active site, in which case we call it what? Non-competitive inhibition. Or better still, they can bind to the enzyme substrate complex. Either way, they transform the active site and make it unavailable or unaccessible to transform the substrate to become product. Then we also saw, I think one of you raised this question and I was very impressed. Sometimes inhibitors can bind transiently to the enzyme. So the enzyme can de detach itself from the substrate and then get on with activity. So we'll call it reversible inhibition. Then there are times the inhibitor will bind sort of permanently to the substrate and that becomes what? A kind of a permanent inhibition or irreversible inhibition. Then we also saw finally that enzyme inhibition can be exploited pharmacologically to make various drugs, one of which is what? AC blockers or AC inhibitors, as you saw. There are so many of them. Most of what we call painkillers or analgesic or NSAIDs, non steroid anti inflammatory drugs, act pharmacologically as well competitive inhibitors of various enzymes. So I have referred you to go read about that. Are you okay on your own? And um, lastly, we saw something on enzyme specificity. And we said that. In terms of specificity, there are two main models that have been proposed to explain how enzymes show specificity for a particular substrate. The first is called what? Um, lock and key model or lock and key theory, which suggests that the enzyme active site act as what? The lock. And then the substrate act as what? The key. And for enzyme to ca ensure catalysis, or for catalysis to be possible, there has to be a perfect match, mm -hmm. a perfect bind, or a perfect fit. Uh, that way, the enzyme is able to transform the substrate to become product. Anything aside that the enzyme rejects it, or the enzyme sees the substrate as not a, its substrate. Are you okay? So it rejects, and then there wouldn't be any catalysis. Then we have what we call the induced fit, which suggests that the active site of the enzyme should not necessarily be complementary to the substrate. However, on binding to the substrate, the enzyme adjusts the shape of its active site to be able to perfectly accommodate the substrate so that it can transform it to become what the required product as is expected. So in a nutshell, this is what we spent time to do today. God bless all of you. Have a fulfilling weekend. May November be a month of testimonies. Amen. 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 God bless you too. Amen. May November be the month where the Lord visits you with your Amen. expectation. Amen. So you Amen. Amen. Receive your Amen. testimonies. If you are expecting to be married, receive your mind.
getting a job. Receive your job of Amen. 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 May he keep you. So this is your jollof rice. So this is your jollof rice that I'm saying. Uh, so I'm sure you are full now because uh, 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 all right. So I'll see you next week. Bye bye. Uh, uh, please don't forget to go to church. Very important. <laughs> don't skip church. Don't skip church over over a degree. Okay. Um, God, God, God still matter. So yes. do well to go to church. Okay. All right. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mm. Hey, that can my soul. How can I combine this? That's my clever. Hey, oh, Papa, I know so. Yeah, your degree matter, but don't do it uh, with the exclusion of God. Are you okay? Oh, hey, make, make, hey, make time for God. It matters. It matters, Papa. Some of you are not going for midweek service and you are also not going for Sunday service. How about? Oh, cool. So try, try. Okay. If you can't make it on Sunday, go for midweek service. At least hear the word of God. It will help you. Yes, Reverend. We'll do that. All right, Madam Matilda, go ahead. May God bless and keep you. Bye bye. Amen. Uh, thank you very much for the inspiration and the reminder.